So today I've got a very special guest, Matt Lewis, and we're going to be looking at some armour and talking about do's and don'ts with armour commissioning. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiator, and Matt Lewis. Matt Lewis of various organizations yeah the xrs and various other organizations so um matt is a prolific um commissioner and also manufacturer of very high standard replicas of various things so what we've got for you here is a multi-part uh mini video series isn't it and in this episode we're going to be looking at armor in future episodes we're going to be looking at um, special commissions swords spears other things like that that are very high standard and also we're going to be looking at scabbards which matt himself uh makes um so before we get onto those things, let's first of all have a look at armour. So we in discussion thought it'd be a really good idea, um, as we have both been um, commissioners of armour in the past, and we have had bad experiences <laughs> and some good experiences. So we thought, wouldn't it be useful, given that I guess people out there have plans in the future to commission armour, or have already commissioned armour, and some of your experiences will be echoed here, um, it'd be useful to talk about some do's and don'ts. But first of all, we're going to look at some examples. So, Matt, what have you brought down for me to see? Okay, I mean, in terms of what we could squeeze into the car and go through, these are two different helmets. They're both from the early 1400s. Do you want to give me one and you I'll can you hold one. up the other one? So We've got uh, a great bus on it. Look at that. So okay. this is a type of helmet that was very popular in the early 15th century. Think of Agincourt period, and this is a model on 1410, 1415 yeah, kind of period, isn't it? 1400s, some, somewhere in the early 1410s, teens. And you, 15, 17, something like that. Yeah. And those of you who are really into armour and have watched Ian Laspina's uh, Knight Errant uh, channel will be familiar somewhat, I guess, with the, with the great bassinet. They come in different shapes, different forms. This is particularly an English style one, isn't it? Um, so in this case, it's, got a, it's still got the bassinet pointy crown up there, but you'll notice it's got full rear and front plates, and they're usually made of one back plate and one front plate. And then the visor um, sits down into it um, on effigies. They don't normally have the visor on, do they? So when we come to look at the visors, you have to look at period artwork. Um, funnily enough, on French effigies and uh, brasses, they often show the um, hinge mounting. And on English effigies, they often don't. They sometimes don't bother. Yeah, so, so, and there's a question there. Do they not show them because they weren't there? Um, in fact, in some period artwork, including a couple of um, English manuscripts I, I can think of, they show them in great bassinets and there's no sign of uh, visors on many of those at all. So some of these might have been visorless in an English context because the English like to face, uh, fight with open face, presumably for specialised fighting on foot situation. Yeah. There, there's, you know, there's an argument to be made. There are some advantages to having full visibility and being able to breathe on foot. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a difficult one with a great bassinet because you're, it's bolted down to your breast and back place. You can't move your head at all. It's literally locked in place. So without having a visor, mm. you can't just move your head out of the way. True, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the, face is, the face is a vulnerable target. Know, it's just one thought, but, but we don't know. Until you actually go and try and kill each other in armour, Yeah, we, we, there's some answers we're just not going to have. Yeah, We have to be at peace with that. But as I've banged on about in, in uh, videos uh, talking about open face helmets, we know that people were wearing you know, um, iron hats, sallets, all sorts of helmets, bassinets, very often with open face helmets. But in this case, this is furnished with a visor. Um, so tell us a little bit about where you got the inspiration for this from, why you had this one made. Um, what it was for, and that oh kind of God. stuff. Okay, um, <laughs> so it kind of landed on the period because doing Fiore and was doing part of, part of a living history group that uh, with the exiles that was demonstrating uh, period martial arts at, at uh, living history and reenactment occasions and stuff like that. Um, and I wanted to do an English armour mainly, and I'll be completely honest, it, it's Toby Catwell's book on the subject. Just, it just, it's a revelation. It just kind of opens up the whole subject. It presents it in a digestible fashion. It's not like any scholarly book I've read before it. Um, and it really sort of teaches you how to look at armour, how to think about armour, how to dissect armour and look at the function and look at details and effigies and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, well, it's still within the lifetime of Fiore to do 1410 
14, 15, 14, somewhere, somewhere in that window. Mm. And realistically, a Condottiore that had gone to Italy to fight might take his armour, and it, it's totally, it fits. It still works. Mm. So I just, you know, went through the process of using Toby's book and a bunch of other stuff and researched it. But, um, you know, wanted a proper great bassinet to experience what fighting in one was like. Um, and I kind of choose all that stuff and it, it just went with the kit there's an image of the whole impression that we can, can show you just to kind of so you can see what we arrived at um, and, and obviously you can tell it's made for foot combat because most a lot of the time this side will be reinforced and have no breaths because that's your lance side Although there is, I suppose these uh, Toby would know better than me and there's other people that know better than me I'm by no means an expert on this subject Obviously, the neck defence has come in. I suspect probably because the lance rest and the use of lances was making uh, a male ventail basically <laughs> pointless. And um, th obviously, immediately we've just replaced the male ventail with like hardened steel plates. You get some incredible neck protection. But the usual thing with armour is the more protection you get, you lose mobility or yeah. you lose visibility. You're going to lose something somewhere. It's always a compromise. And this is one extreme of that. You, you lose all your head mobility mm. and you're trying to compensate that with your big visor full of breaths and, and these aren't just breaths, it actually opens up your field of vision. You can see quite well in that, you just can't move your head. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's something that I wanted to mention actually is, um, as Matt mentioned, if you're looking at helmets, um, well, a lot of helmets, but that are perhaps primarily designed for mounted use, you'll, you'll often find that this side of the helmet doesn't have any breaths on it and this side does. In this case, you'll notice it's got breaths on both sides. Now, these aren't, although the name breaths, you're just thinking about breathing, and a lot of people think, oh, you look through this bit and you breathe through this bit. But in reality, when you're inside this helmet, you can see and breathe through all of it, okay? So if a helmet doesn't have breaths, of course you can still breathe in it because the air goes in and out out of the, um, the vision slot or whatever you've got there. Um, but in this case, not only can you breathe through the whole lot, but you can see through the whole lot. And having this whole front perforated is really, really um, advantageous if you're fighting on foot. And it really gives you much, much better vision. And Toby Catpole himself uh, mentions in his first book, I think it is, uh, towards the end, that he was really number one surprised by how much visibility the great bassinet gave him but equally how vulnerable it makes you feel initially because he'd spent years and years jousting with a helmet that was basically closed down here and you couldn't really see much through which if you're sitting on a horse with a lance coming at you in some cases a solid wooden lance then it makes you feel very protected. But suddenly, if you can see through all of this, despite the fact there's steel there, you can now see this <laughs> lance coming straight at your coming face. At you, yeah. yeah, so so it can be, um, you know, perhaps in that sense, it could be more scary to wear. But ultimately, it gives you a huge amount better breathing and a huge amount of better visibility. So it's all about trade-offs, isn't it? It's very protect. It's it is one extreme of armor development. Hmm. It's about the most protective helmet for foot combat you're going to get, and it does stick around for that purpose for yeah. a long time. Yeah, and that's and I think a lot of people I've seen a lot of people on the internet uh, saying, you know, oh, the great bassinet went out of use by so and so date. But the fact is, uh, you know, most people say kind of in the uh, I don't know about 1420s 1430s but in reality um, this was still in use in the late 15th century it's sometimes on the battlefield but all the time in tournaments particularly foot tournaments sometimes mounted um, particularly for club tournaments where they're hitting each other with big, big, big wooden maces basically but certainly for things like pole axe combat it was the, pretty much the standard helmet in uh, certainly England and France and Spain um, and sometimes in Italy yeah. and Germany. I mean, on that subject, why why it's good and what makes it excellent is when you're getting hit very hard on the head, um, it's the shock's not. It doesn't go into your head anymore. It's you don't get the concussion because the the neck piece and the neck plates and everything, all of that force is redistributed into your body. Yeah. And we've tried it on, and I've been hit in the head a lot. And <laughs> it you, shows. It's, you're like, <laughs> but you do feel like a tank in it. It's very, yeah. very protective. Like it's one thing, one thing I have noticed. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the next helmet in a second. But one thing I have noticed about these from a friend of mine who's got a great bassinet is that it's not very pleasant being thrown 
onto the ground in one uh, because normally when you fall over you tend to instinctively you know move your head in directions away from the floor and it helps you getting up again when your head is locked inside one of these if you get pushed over in one and then try to get up it is more difficult so it is I would say well he's found so anyway you have to more, learn to live with it yeah it is a different type of thing but so long as you're on your feet and so long as you're whacking people with a pole axe and they're whacking you with a pole axe this generally speaking offers a lot of advantages over a lot of other helmets and therefore it's why it continued in tournament use i should have mentioned into the 16th century so henry the eighth has a great bassinet you know for foot combat they were still used in the 16th century for tournaments and they were still used sometimes in war in the second half of the 15th century even if things like sallets and armets have become more common by that point successful design. so talking about armets <laughs> let's have a look at your other oh i'm quite happy to put that down i have to tell you it's a heavy helmet so you think about the amount of steel in that great bassinet, it's roughly twice as much steel as in my sallet, which you've seen loads on my channel. So it's a heavy object to hold for a long time. So um, I guess this is the other end of the spectrum, and it is also more or less exactly the same period, actually. But this is what they were doing in Italy. Take that up to the viewers and, and let them have is, a good um, close look. And this is what you will see... Uh, depicted in Fiori's manuscripts, definitely the Getty. Mm. Um, it's probably more recognisable. So the character, so this might, so I think a lot of people out there might think this looks like the archetypal knight's helmet, what you think of as what a knight wears on their head. But the characteristic feature of the armour, now I have to say I've never actually handled this particular armour before, but in theory, so this has got a locking visor, which actually weren't that common in I period. Don't but it's it's kind of common in period, no. it's just uh, it's a personal choice so this the characteristic of the armet is and how this differs from a close helmet for example is that these two cheek pieces a bit like a roman helmet open up to the side like wings like gold wing doors on a lamborghini and they lock down at the chin so this was it seems to have been a particular italian innovation if I remember correctly, the earliest example we have in art is from the 1390s, I think about 1396. Um, and it's possible they were experimenting with this concept. There are some, there's a great bassinet which has an opening flap from um, Brescia, I think. Um, but you will see here on the side are hinges. And in this case, the hinge is hidden underneath a protective flap so that the hinge can't be broken by things coming down and glancing off the skull. So we've got a solid skull piece with a essentially a tail going down the back and then these two cheek pieces which connect together at the chin and encase the head. Um, and then of course we have down here because it has to encase we have an aventail that opens at the front and the back because it has to be able to come up with those gullwing doors. Could you demonstrate how that opens up? Yeah, because I'm I'm um, not familiar with this uh, this I, I particular think helmet. A brilliant design actually. I absolutely love this helmet like a lot. It's just a pleasure to wear. It's 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 really clever. Can we just show that at the camera? Yeah, the, I'm going to uh, try and show you. I mean, some of these have they'll have a little twisty lock on there. But we haven't done that with this one, but you can just when it's done properly and it fits. The whole thing opens up. Mm. That will try and get you. It's got this strange um a strange feature to the design that because it opens up like this the padding on each side has to be separate from the padding on the inside which is put around there so you've got separate padding on each side here separate padding in there and then as i mentioned separate male aventel on each yeah, side right. so it all kind of has to close together but in many ways this is this is much more well, i i my i personally this is a lot more advanced than the great bassinet this is this is a lot more of the shape of where things go mm. and the arm it's quite successful it sticks around for a while yeah i mean um, again the arm it stays around to the 16th century but what's interesting is in the in the later there we go and it looks good as well doesn't it it's it's got a streamlined look whereas the great bassinet is quite big and bulky but the, I can, you know i do actually lose breathing and vision with this but i can move my head my body is easier to move with this on yeah um I just, I just really like the armit, and I was going to... Other thing to mention as well is in Fiore, he shows it without the visor on, doesn't he? So if you could just connect that back up the together tab, yeah. for a second. So this shape, if you look in Fiore's treaties, they were worn particularly for fighting on foot, sometimes with the visor removed. And you'll notice, if you could just move a bit over here and turn your head this way, there we go, there are pins, like with the bassinet at the side, and you can pull those pins out and take the visor off. So if you take the visor off, this is now quite a good foot combat helmet. Yeah, okay, you've got a little bit of 
opening face. But this is not dissimilar to a salad, salad and a beva arrangement. That shape is like a beva, obviously the top part is like a salad. So all you've got is this exposed little hole here, but what you gain again is the vision, the breathing, being able to hear it a bit better and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, this is a more advanced design. This is something that comes around for the first time in about the 1390s. They start to become more common in Italy in the beginning of the 1400s, 1410, 1420, and they really... Um, there is no great bassinet, well, the there are very few great bassinets from Italy in this period. They seem to, the Italians seem to have really just gone with the Armet idea I mean, and I run think, with it. I think the assumption you can possibly make is, that, as I understand it, the Italians were very much into their horse combat, they liked to ride, mm. and their armour design kind of follows that proclivity. Well, this also, is, on this is nice on a horse because you can turn your head. Yeah, and, and that's <laughs> absolutely vital. I think anyone who has tried to do any type of skillet arms or combat type stuff on the horseback, you know, your, your, your horse can't turn in the same way that your head can. So your ability to be able to do this and see what's happening around you is super important. And if you've got a great bassinet, you have to turn your body around to look around. Okay, you can turn your head a little bit inside, but mostly you have to turn the body, which you can't do if you're sitting on a horse, because if you turn your body, the horse will go like that when you don't necessarily want it to. Um, and you maybe in that certain saddle, you can't necessarily turn very far to look around anyway. So Armet totally better suited to combat on horseback. The Armet does start to spread around Europe. We see them in Germany, don't we, by the really, well, I think about 1420s, 30s. Um, they start to appear in Germany. We do see them in... Um, you see them in England. You see them in England yeah. by about 1450. Uh, so the famous um, Earl of Warwick um, effigy, he's got essentially an Italian armour that seems to have been made for him, for the English market. So it's got some English features to it, but it's basically an Italian export armour. And what looks like almost a great bassinet at the front, because of the style of the visor on it, has, it's a bit like the Kerberg um, jousting great bassinet. At the back, it very clearly has the, ov the overlapping plates we saw there of the armet. So it is an armet. So we know that armets were in England by about 1450. So in the Wars of the Roses, for example, for, so 1455, 1485, there would have been lots of armets around. However, probably for fighting, well, for the majority of people, they would have had salets uh, because they're more general purpose hel uh, helmets for war. And they were the most popular type of helmet pretty much everywhere in Europe in the second half of the 15th century. But armets were still very popular, particularly for cavalry. They, there's also another successful design that does sort of stick around in one form or another mm. for a while. Um, mm. I mean, I'm sure someone will correct me because my interests don't really extend, but I'm pretty sure I've seen 16th oh, yeah. century armets or variants thereof. Yeah, so armet stays around to the 16th century, but what's interesting as well is because the close helmet, which um, artic opens in a different way, so the close helmet opens, the front opens up. So you close the front down over the throat and then the visor comes down. Sometimes the visor is two part. A lot of those early close helmets were converted armets. So we know a whole bunch of, from about 1480 onwards, there are a whole bunch of armets, which are earlier armets, so 1450, 1460 armets, that are then converted, upgraded to this new system, the close helmet. Yeah, that's that's in, a thing that happens, because the, the early great bassinets are clearly possibly older bassinets. Oh, I'm certain, gone, yeah. Let's put some neck plates Yeah, absolutely. Make it work. And if you could just pass me that great bassinet as well. So just to rewind uh, for a second in technology, because it links in here. This didn't just spring out of nowhere. As Matt mentioned, originally you get armets with the male avantel and they add a throat plate at the front. And some of the earliest, um, if you want to call it a gorget, if you, um, some of the earliest appearances of these are in a jousting context, actually worn with the great helm. Um, so in the early 14th century, we see them worn, for example, in the Romance of Alexander with a great helm. Um, so if you've got the idea to add a plate on here to protect the neck, then it's not too much of a leap to then add another one on the back. And then once you've got this, you think, and there are early great bassinets which show male underneath as well. So they've still got an aventail. And then at some point you go, well, we don't need the aventail anymore because we've made this really I mean, well. The so. skull is basically unchanged. Yeah. It, it, you know, same and the visor. And you see that type of visor with aventail um, hunt skull bassinets as well. So yeah, Different attachment, things like that. But yeah. permutations thereof yeah. you know, yeah. are around. But yeah. The skull, you know, it is a bassinet. It, and the yeah. bassinet, I don't know, I, again, bit out of my field of interest, but I'm pretty sure it dates to 
13 something or other, doesn't it? The bassinet sort of pops Oh, up. yeah, 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 yeah. It goes back right to the beginning of the 14th century, beginning of the 1300s, yeah, and originally developed from the um, Cervelier worn underneath the Great Helm. And originally, bassinets were worn underneath Great Helms, and then gradually they become the helmet in their own right, and you don't have a Great Helm over top. Right, so those are the two helmets we've got here. We've also got some mail. Let's have a quick look at the mail. Um, should we look at the standard first? Yeah, or yeah, we could do yeah? that. I mean, it, this does feed into, I think, some we're going to touch on a bit later is the armour commission, sure. and things you need um, that don't really get talked about and should be, yeah. and should have some money spent on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, well, absolutely, and we'll come to that point in a minute. So, this is the male standard. You've seen probably mine. Mine is a cheaper version, but this is a much more tailored, um, better quality, better quality male um, and very nice uh, padding and leather edging that Matt's been. See better picture of that on Nicholas Checksfield's website, I think, and he did all the work. So that's Nicholas Checkfield. Checksfield. Checksfield. Okay, so we'll stick the link below to his business. There's not so, so he's someone that Matt's worked with quite a bit, and he's a specialist in mail and the things attached to mail. And restoration and reproduction. He's, he's a genius, basically. Cool. <laughs> and <laughs> then we've also got. Oh, if you don't hold that up to the camera so that is a voider T -shirt, T -shirt. Um, yeah so it's one half one half of a uh, a crop top essentially so it's it's what goes in this part so the upper arm and the armpit and the very top of your shoulder um, and this goes in the gap of course where plate armor can't be unless you have there are some rare exceptions of articulated plates and armpits but overall you can't put plate and armpits very easily so they generally uh, fill those gaps with mail in earlier periods they just had a full male shirt and they put the plate over the top but they gradually found that you could just fill the holes and ha not have to wear so much mate so, male so this is very uh fine uh six millimeter that is six um, millimeter, yeah. dome riveted mixed with solid it looks yeah, like yeah half and half, half yeah solid, half so riveted. very nice and this has been tailored uh, to give it more expansion in the armpit yeah, it's, it's so it's got to a gusset. It fit, it's to make it not bunch up in your arm. It's to give you the, the proper range of motion in armour because you don't want it to kind of interfere with yourself or your armour. Mm. Um, and it, I suppose it matters less these days because no one's really trying to kill anyone in armour. But <laughs> you would definitely want something in your armpits yeah. and the gaps in your armour in the period because that's exactly where people are going to try and get yeah. you. <laughs> and even in, in a, even in a reenactment context, you know, recently when I was at Tewkesbury and I was just having fun and no one was really trying to hurt each other for the most part, um, I was conscious of the fact that I was basically covered in hardened steel plate, but my armpits, I didn't bother wearing voiders. So uh, if I'd accidentally took a, a bill thrust to the armpit, that would have really hurt. Um, so yeah, even from a modern safety point of view, and if you're doing HEMA harness vectum where you're actually specifically armed, uh, aiming at the armpits for example because why aim at the breastplate if you can aim at the armpit then in that case you need something there to protect you so even from a modern sort of sporting or hobby perspective very very useful thing and it's worth investing in good quality yeah. mail certainly in period obviously it's the difference between someone being able to take you out in one go and yeah. maybe not you know maybe you're still in the fight yeah or rather than being dead you're just you know you can retreat and mm. get out and here we've got the the skirt and this you can imagine where the skirt goes um and it uh initially in the 14th century these were very important because of course you only have a breastplate uh, or a lot of people only wore breastplate on the top half of the body and this was the primary defense protecting your lower abdomen and crotch when in time they start to add a fold that is laminated plates over the top of this but they still retain the skirt and these skirts were still being worn right the way through into the 16th century underneath the cuirass in some cases we now know that they didn't wear a full skirt and they actually just had a hem attached to the inside of the fold of the cuirass which is something i might be looking at with my next armor yeah, which there's, there's a few ways of doing it um, yeah that's just the way we decided to do that one but i've seen it with a canvas band i've yeah. seen people just uh tie it up i don't i don't know and i know enough to know i don't know enough yeah. that's just the that's just what we chose to do with that and oftentimes there's not one one right and one wrong way to do these things there are like voiders are one solution they did sometimes wear what, what some people call boleros or crop tops these days they did sometimes wear a full male shirt right even right the way through the 15th century that was sometimes done um the skirts as i say sometimes there were double skirts sometimes people wore um uh, uh male 
shorts, essentially, um, brayettes. Sometimes uh, they had the male attached to the full sleeve. There's various different ways of doing it. And bear in mind, there were different, obviously different styles of play armor, different traditions and different ideas, just as there are now. Not everyone did it the same way. Right, okay, so I hope that's been interesting so far. Now what we thought would be useful for some of you are some do's and don'ts. Um, over the last probably year or two, um, Matt and I have had some discussions about our armor commissioning experiences some which have been good some which have been bad and extremely frustrating on both our parts and both of us have ordered armor and commissioned armor to be made for us where we were very unhappy with the results and this happens i'm afraid sometimes doesn't it so let's talk about some basic do's and don'ts what are your first thoughts on this yeah i mean i suppose that's kind of how we got talking and why i thought do you know what no one really talks about this openly you're kind of left to your own and to some degree it's kind of left to the armorer to instruct you and they're not they're not your life coach they're an armorer that's their specialty and um it would just be nice to have a conversation about people who go i'm not an expert if anything i've done everything wrong but to some degree that that gives me a platform to kind of discuss this with you and sort of say these are all the things i've done wrong don't do that yeah. and also these are things i wish i knew and I could have saved myself a lot of time, effort, money and, and stress mm. just having had those conversations with people. So, uh, yeah, first do. So um, stuff that people don't talk about enough is how do we start this? Get right back to the very start. So what do you want it for? Yeah. What are you going to be doing with it? And is it for is it for HEMA? Is it just for for yeah. cosplay? You know, dressing up. Is it for is it for reenactment? Is it for Bohurt? And those are completely different. Yeah, requirements. and they're all furnished in different ways, and they're all yeah. going to have slightly different requirements. Um, and then, kind of after you've looked at that, you're then like, what period? So that <laughs> that is a major thing. So I so the other thing I want to just throw in, toss in right at the beginning is don't assume your armor knows everything okay because there are a lot of armorers out there who can make perfectly good armor and they might be able to copy um you know the the milanese harness in glasgow the avant harness brilliantly but if you ask them to do something else they might not be good at that or they might not know very much about that so learn as much as you possibly can and this is the same advice i'd give anyone getting into collecting antique swords okay before you go out and start throwing money at things first of all decide what you want Secondly, learn as much as you possibly can about the thing you want. And obviously, we're somewhat different cases than an average person because we, we get a bit obsessive about things and want to know as much as we possibly can. Um, so maybe we're on some kind of spectrum there. I think that we just oh, want yeah. to know. Oh. Uh, so, but just a regular average person, okay? Try and learn as much as you can about the topic because you might find that you end up knowing more about specific aspects of the armour you want than the armorer who's making it for you. And you can help them, you can guide them. And there's many, many different ways of learning. Obviously there's books, obviously there's forums like Armor Archive or the 15th Century Armor page on Facebook or whatever, but also talking to other people who've got armor, their experiences, their experiences of ordering armor, wearing armor, this kind of stuff. So there's many, many different ways of learning. Just to learn as much as you can. And remember that an armor will take a long time to make. Yeah. So, so you can get on someone's waiting list and in that time, still be narrowing down, you know, learning as much as you can and narrowing down on exactly it is what you want to do. Sorry. It's actually quite a subject. There's a, there's a lot that feeds into it. And like the, the weight is one thing and that's a factor you've got, kind of got to consider and look into. And different armourers are going to have different waiting list times and build times. And those aren't necessarily accurate <laughs> either. They're um, very, very rarely accurate. So, I mean, I think in, I've not, whether it's been swords or armour or anything else, I can't personally remember a craftsman ever delivering on time. It's just been varying degrees of late. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I, yes, I guess because some have been extremely appallingly ludicrously late yeah. and some people have been pretty close. Okay. And when you look at the broader context of... Generally, it's going to be late, yeah. and you make peace with that, yeah. and you'll save yourself yeah. a lot of stress. 
But um, And it can sometimes be useful because sometimes in that extra bit of time you can narrow down a few more details of what you want to change. Or I have had it in the past. I've got like multiple, multiple commissions on and some stuff's kind of dragged out for a really long time and some people have done stuff really quickly and then they yeah. all finish it once. And you're like, I, I've got no money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I don't know, I'm going to have to sell somebody's organs to... to yeah to pay for this now but yeah. that's rare and probably best not to have too many plates spinning at once yeah but um so my so my sorry to jump in again so my top two i meant to say this in the first bit i was saying for my two top tips personally were was number one as you said period and if if possible specific armor okay so uh, try and narrow down what you want as specifically as possible. In my case with my next armor, it is exactly based on one particular effigy and I am learning as much as I can about that effigy and comparable effigies from the same time period um, and how all the different you know, uh, nuts and bolts go together on that particular armor as I possibly can so that I can help my armorer to understand exactly how those greaves close, which side the hinge and the strap is on, or some some of them have straps on both sides. Um, exactly how those pulleys are articulated, this type of thing. Okay, so I want to be completely on top of. It's like any project. If you're the project manager and you're the person who's paying for it, if you're the project manager, you want to know as much about the project as possible. It doesn't matter that you're a project manager. You want to know how the person doing the most basic job in that project does it. Okay, um, and narrowing down, as I say, narrowing down the period and choosing your armorer for that project. And it won't always be the same. So you might think this armorer is amazing, but they might be amazing at Italian 15th century armor. And what you're getting is a, uh, let's say late 14th century English armor. And those are different things, okay? Equally, this guy might be great at German Gothic, but know very, very little about Fury period, um, early 14th yeah, I mean, century. The, there's quite a lot to unpack century. in yeah. just choosing your armor because there's, there's lots of things to consider. It's like, how far away is he? Yeah, yeah. Because fittings and, and your armor will be better if it's better fitted to you. And the more easily you can go and see them, and the more easily you can be in the same room with that person and talk over details and check fit and fettle and fiddle, the better the end result will be. Mm. So, to some degree, there are some very good people abroad who are quite familiar with that, and you can send them body casts and you can send them measurements, and you, you will get a functional armor back. And picking an armor kind of starts with, well, well, what do I want it for? Am I doing Boho? Am I doing LARP? Am I doing living history? Am I doing reenactment? And that kind of helps you pick an armor. That gives you your pool of armors because there are Boho armors. There are living history armors. There are armors that specialize in other stuff. And there is some crossover mm. depending on what you just want to do. Because if you just want to do HEMA, for example, Getting a boho armor isn't a terrible idea because mm. they they tend to be quite affordable. They tend to have quite a quick turnaround. Qu quicker, usually pre-produced in many cases off the shelf kind of thing. And yeah. they've been tested to destruction. Mm. Like they have, a lot of these workshops have been doing it for long enough now. They're having the stuff smashed to bits every week, and it will work. It will function. They figured out their heat treat. They've yeah. figured out the, a, a good level of functionality for a reasonable entry price. It's maybe not quite quite as perfect and smooth and wonderful as it would be with a full custom fit but it will get you going it'll mm. be cheap and it will survive anything you're going to put it through as a as a uh, a hemorist yeah for sure yeah that's so just one one way of looking at it and one way of drilling down to a solution but then okay let's look at burha armor workshops mm. Where do I get that from? Do I go to Ukraine? Do I go to Russia? Do I go to Poland? Do yeah. I try and find someone in the UK that's making it? It's a big subject. There's, there's also, I think, in terms of how different armors work. So Boha armor is an interesting example because it's designed, it's optimized. And in fact, a lot of the armorers, like Alexei Perebinos, for example, who made by Brigandine, he will talk about a certain piece of armor, for example, a Brigandine being Boha optimized okay which means that he will make a historical Leeds brigandine or he'll make a Bohurt optimized brigandine based or inspired by the Leeds um, brigandine and th they're different things the plates are arranged slightly differently you know maybe um, the um, straps are in slightly different places the fit is slightly different this kind of thing because they're for different purposes one's made historically for war and one's made for Bohurt which is a type of sport combat um, with specific rules so they're made for different purposes, but equally, even if we look at historical armors, historical armors are made for different purposes. We've touched on that with the helmets. Do you, you might choose an armet or a great bassinet based purely on which one you prefer the look of, 
but what are you going to be using it for? Are you going to be riding around on a horse doing skillet arms, tent pegging with it? Well then I'd say get an arm at it, <laughs> or even better get a salad with an open face. Um, but if you're going to be fighting on pole axe, with pole axes on foot, you can use either, but historically the great bassinet was the, the chosen helmet for that particular task for a set of reasons. So Equally, I'd apply this to gauntlets. Okay, this is an interesting one, and I went down a massive rabbit hole with gauntlets because I'm really fussy about, uh, you know, because I like using swords, I like using weapons, and I usually do it unarmored. So when I put a load of armors on, I don't like certain types of gauntlets because of the way that they restrict my movement. Now, all gauntlets restrict your movements to some extent. I would say actually one of the least restrictive gauntlets are 14th century hourglass gauntlets. Um, great mobility on those but not great protection. They've got pretty good protection, but for poleaxe fighting, for example, you're better off with some type of mitten gauntlet, which don't exist in the 14th century. So that's why Bohart people look 14th century, but often have mitten gauntlets, because <laughs> otherwise you get your fingers smashed. Um, but in a 15th century context, yes, I want a mitten gauntlet, but then there were different types of mitten gauntlets. There are German types, there are various Italian types, there are English types that, that were known and are mentioned in Burgundian sources, for example, as English gauntlets, which are half mitten, half finger. So you've got a mixture of protection and, and dexterity there. Um, and these often have different uh, degree of wrist articulation as well. English gauntlets at the time seem to very often have articulation lames in the wrist for greater wrist mobility. Italian mitten gauntlets almost never do, but they often have an hourglass um, cuff shape, which gives you wrist movement in a different way. So learning about these things, it's very sort of very detailed. And, and it's, as I say, it's going down the rabbit hole. But the more you learn about it, the more you realize what it is you need or want for your thing. Or you can do partly what I can do, I'm doing now, is I'm going, I want to have an English harness of circa 1470 and damn everything else, I will live with it. And I think this is the other way of coming at it. So I'm kind of coming at my next harness from a living history perspective. I'm just going, I'm just going to copy what he had and then learn as much as I can about it. So it's almost experimental archaeology. I'm not making really concessions for Pima or Boha or any other specific thing. I'm just trying to, as accurately as possible, copy one specific armour with some minor artistic differences, but functionally one specific armour from 1470-ish um, and see, see what I learn about it. And I will have a specific helmet for doing Polax combat, for example, but he would have done as well. Um, he would have stuck a great bassinet on to do polex combat. So that's another way of coming at it. So how do you choose your armourer? <laughs> I think there's, so there's time scales, there's cost, there's geography, geography, and are they good at making what you want? So we were talking, and we won't, we're not going to name specific armourers in this video because that's not fair, either for, for, for a plus or a minus point, it's not really fair in this video because we're talking about su such diverse topics. But I was talking about, before this video started, a particular armourer who's um, salads have particularly impressed me and again we were talking about the fact that some armourers are good at one thing and some armourers are good at another thing. Someone who might be amazing at making helmets might be appalling at making leg harness because they're really different things. Um, so I know some people out there uh, and again I won't name names are now increasingly moving towards ordering different bits of harness from different armourers. Uh, I kind of that's sort of what happened to me because of the things we're talking about and it is a good way to go and uh, people have done that i think mm. toby's latest one is a bit of a yeah to to toby toby goes to different armors for different, different bits and, people yeah. for the bits on that and it's it's worked it's fine um and i think we were talking about this a little bit the period workshops they are period workshops they're not period master smith on his own make a whole a whole harness that just yeah. doesn't really happen They'd have a guy making legs. His one job is to make legs. He is legs guy. Mm. He will make your legs. And there's a guy that does the same for your arms, and does the same for your body, and the same for your helmet, the same for your gauntlets, and the same for your fitting. And that almost specialists. Yeah, and that almost certainly stems from the period when people were covered head to foot in mail, but had. Uh, you know, helmet and other bits that were made by completely different types of craftsmen. Hence the surname Helmschmied, like Lawrence Helmschmied, Helmsmith, because his family were known as Helmsmiths. You know, that's what they made. They made helms. They didn't make male hauberks. They didn't make shorts. They made helms. Um, and equally, when we come into the 15th century, that's the same again. You know, the specialists are making different types of things. And it makes sense because 
different people have got different strengths and weaknesses, different people have got a different artistic eye for different parts um, or a mechanical mind or an artistic mind and I think someone who can get the shape right on a particular type of helmet, whatever it is, great bassinet, salet, armet, whatever, is not necessarily going to be the same person who really gets how a hand functions and articulates. And sometimes it's to do with experience as well. And I've noticed a lot of people who are the best at doing gauntlets are also the people who are familiar with using weapons. And it has to be said, a lot of armourers, they probably started out doing some reenactment and doing that kind of stuff, but then just fell down the armouring thing and don't do any real combat stuff anymore. And so and they probably have never done any HEMA in most cases, so they're not necessarily familiar with the ways that we want I mean, to be able to move our hands. Point. Like a lot of armourers are not necessarily coming at this as, uh, with the mentality of either a user no. or a wearer or from any combat experience whatsoever. No. Most, most of them that I know don't have any so or almost none. So they're completely reliant on feedback from the customers, but the issue we've got in the modern age is the customers don't know what to <laughs> back because we're not trying to kill each other in combat or so. they're or they're feeding back different things based on and so you know with the wrist with the gauntlets and the bohart example again the types of gauntlets that are made for bohart are usually not at all historical they have completely unhistorical wrist articulations there's the mentioned you know hourglass style gauntlets with mitten fingers this kind of which there's a vague comparison for that in history but generally speaking they are making bohurt gauntlets for bohurt they are not making replica medieval gauntlets so anymore they're, they're making a contextual um, yeah it's yeah. just it's essentially it's a, it's historically inspired uh, modern sports armor and this goes for helmets as well and if we look at some of the helmets used in in bohurt hurt um, but you know and equally in reenactment and some some reenactment armor the shapes are just wrong or they're the the certain bits of armor are built a bit too big because people are not fitting them over the correct undergarments which is the other thing i want to talk well, about I, once you've <laughs> chosen your well possibly even before you've chosen your armor definitely after you've picked your period pick your period pick your armor but before you even go to somebody or before they're going to be able to make your armor, you, you have to, you have to sort out your undergarments. Yes. Because the whole thing is built on that. It's super important. And, and that's no not easy. Yeah. And that's not easy in itself. So that is or can be as difficult. Finding someone who's going to make an arming doublet fit right and move right for you, tailored perfectly to you, can be yeah. as difficult as finding a good armourer. Okay? Uh, in fact, we can talk about that a bit because I, I went through... So I discovered that I needed arming clothes. You can't just, uh, you know, dial up the armour, yeah, I need a harness, it'll be X amount of time. Um, you need your arming doublet because your measurements are based on you in the arming doublet. But an mm. arming dub doublet is a functional object. It's not just a jumper you throw on. Yeah. It does a job. Mm. And its job sometimes or often is to support the weight of the legs in such a fashion that when you raise your arms, you don't lift the legs up. Yeah. Because that's super fun. Uh, <laughs> having, just, to, having to carry the legs weight on your arm. So I just quickly grab my arm doublet here. There are so many things to consider, so I'm not going to put it fully on for the purpose of this video. But first of all, with this particular start, it wants to come very tight into the waist, so much so that it's practically like a, a corset. That will be better for the fit of your armour, and it will be better for um, taking the weight of your leg harness, um, so sp spreading out the weight. It, it's better for your movement, it supports the lower back, all sorts of things. So having an arm iron doublet that's really tight into your natural waist and has a corset-like effect, very, very important. Secondly, the importance of the arm articulation, so that when you move your arms, it it's not pulling your waist up and down or pulling your therefore your leg harness up and down very very important also very important how the bend of the elbow works and so you don't end up with too much bunching here or too much stretch here and same for the shoulder of course but also it has to be tight enough to your arms that it's not going to create all kind of uncomfortable folds and creases underneath the arm harness as well um, and it's got almost no padding to it this is really to prevent chafing and to provide a solid basis for the armor to be attached to once you've got your arming doublet sorted out and bear in mind you need hose as well and you need your well, you infinity know, wearing i mean before we get off because i don't want to get too far off this yeah. i found with me i just struggled to get the tailoring quite right the, right my it was separating the waist from the upper arm movements so no matter what i did mm. and you could see it on my army double which is somewhere i'd actually put the holes in and we tried tried leg armor yeah um on the doublet and no matter what i did and we went through i think two or three different army doublets still lifting the legs up lifting the legs up lifting the legs up so 
Right. These. So that's called, a, and I can never say this word properly. Le denier. Le denier. <laughs> Le denier. Yeah. And um, this just kills that in one stroke because yeah. it's, it's basically a suspender belt for men. Well, it's like a um, mini corset, really, isn't it? Ladies wear it too, I yeah. suppose, yeah. for armour. So it's just a, it's a very, show that. very So it laces at the back. Belt. And then the, uh, the leg harness um, hangs off these waxed points at the front. And so that isolates around your waist. So my, my arming doublet, doublet is doing the same thing, but all in one go. Um, and as I say, when that's done up tightly, it takes me in there. And that becomes, that's my le denier, essentially, at the bottom there. Uh, but but that's much, another way of achieving it. It's tailor, and there's not yeah. many people that can really make an arming doublet. But it's just, you'll find this a lot with a lot of things in living histories. Like it's just... When it's not a living tradition, when it's not an active living market, like you and I can go and get tyres for our car, we can drive around the corner, so I want to put the tyres on. Yeah. That's how easy it is in period to go and get an army doublet, but we don't have that. No. No one's got that experience, no one's grown up doing it, yeah. no one really understands the materials as much. So it's important to emphasise as well, so at the same time as doing all the things to do with the armour that you were doing, about choosing the period, choosing the armour, blah blah blah, and what purpose it's for, you must also be looking at who you're going to get your arming doublet from and it should be someone who has physical access to your body <laughs> okay you need to try it on this this took uh i think a couple of fittings of of you know a, a period of time um of checking everything to get it working as it works now now that my tailor has all of that information in patterns that's stored away i can get more of them made it's less of a hassle now and this would have happened in periods so you know you would have even if your tailor had been let's say in paris and you were from somewhere in england you might travel over to paris for a few days and get your uh, arming doublet sources and that'd be fine that workshop would now as long as you didn't get too much bigger or smaller would now have your patterns for your arming doublet for, for that's, however that's long. the next interesting point isn't it because if you don't lose weight or, yeah. or, or weight or change shape too much yeah that can even in the pro making a suit of armor as you said earlier takes a long time mm. and if your shape were to change significantly between the time he took the measurements yeah and there's no fittings or anything in between then you need the brush plate stretcher yeah <laughs> or, or you, you can end up with a suit of armor that's made for a different shape you yeah, know, yeah and then doesn't work properly. and we know you know henry the eighth we know that yeah. we can we can plot the changing shape yeah, of his body did, yes. through his armors and he started off a pretty you know a muscular but slim guy he's in good shape for some, like some of his early armors and was definitely not slim by the later armors so so yeah but if you're rich enough that's fine however for for most of us who might only be able to afford one or two really good armors, you're going to have to put some time and investment into not changing shape too much. Yeah. And that includes not getting more muscular, ironically. It does, yeah. So if you're, if you're intending to beef up, well, do your beefing up and then order your armour. Because otherwise, quite frankly, if, you're, if your arms or your, you know, anything else, your chest gets really even, even well, an inch bigger, an inch and a half bigger, that's going to be a problem for your arming doublet, for your mail, for your plate, the whole it's lot. It's really anything that causes things to go out of balance. If you're having to fight the armour, if your things are swelling up inside, it's mm. especially over the course of the day, if you were to fight a battle for multiple hours, that's what fatigues you, that's what grinds you down. So my, my arm harness on the armour, the blued armour, the, um, the circa 1460 armour that I wear, the forearms, the, so it was a second hand armor for someone who's a very similar physical shape to me and the forearms are not really quite big enough for me and they do i've altered them slightly and i uh, i essentially strap them up slightly looser to give myself some more space but fundamentally they are a bit too small for my forearms and they yeah it's a problem uh, but my next armor will be made for me and i'll i'll <laughs> make sure that's not so much of an issue so i've just whipped off the uh, arming doublet because it's rather warm today uh, but um the other thing to talk about apart from arming doublets to think about is mail. Now, getting mail tailored is no easy thing either, is it? Because anybody can go online and buy generic chain mail, uh, but that does not in the least mean that it will either work or work underneath plate armour. Um, first of all, it has to work on your body. It has to be articulated right. It has to fit you. But then to fit underneath armour as well, it has to be fairly close fitting. And with certain parameters, there are certain types of Italian harness which go outside of the arm harness and things like that, which are a bit more, more leeway there. Um, but certainly if you're going for a German or an English harness or fr most French harnesses, the male has to go underneath the plate, which means it needs to be close to your body 
without restricting your body. Yeah, that's a, it's, it's, it's a one tough of those, one, isn't it? Like with the army doublets, it's a little bit too much. It doesn't. It's wrong. A little bit too little. It's wrong. You don't really actually have that much wiggle room. Should we just grab one of those voiders just to demonstrate? Yeah. Um, so when he's talking about tailoring, I don't, I don't know if you want to put it on. Yeah, I could slide it on my arm and. Kind of so this is way. obviously without the arming double on, but just to give you a general idea, you can see. I do not have big bingo wings. <laughs> I don't have a lot of mail hanging underneath no, this, here. I mean, this is enough. Once you've got your arming doublet on, it pretty much takes this all up, if yeah. you think about it. Yeah. And it just leaves you enough movement so that it's not constricting that, your arm. And that has to go inside the, the plate arm harness, of course, so it can't be a great big baggy it's sleeve. It's also the tone how high up your armpit comes yeah. and how that functions, because if it's wrong, you end up with a big knot of mail in your armpit, and that becomes very painful and exhausting after a while, and you haven't actually got the full function of your arm. And if you're doing something like couching a lance, for yeah. example, could be a big problem. Um, so it has to be close into you, but equally not prevent you from lifting your arm up. So, you know, it's, it's a tough call. And then there's the quality of the mail as well. And frankly, most mail these days is made in India. There's some made in Eastern Europe as well, isn't there? But um, generally speaking, there'll be a lot of variation in the quality of the fabric, the material, the steel that's used, the quality of the rivets, the holes of the rivets. A lot of people that have been testing mail have found that the standard cheap Indian made mail always fails at the rivet point, whereas handmade mail, um, that costs a lot lot more often won't fail at the rivet point it'll fail anywhere but the rivet point so you can get very different performance issues and obviously we're not always trying to stab each other through mail but just to be aware there's a huge variation in the quality of the mail and the way it moves there is yeah um i mean this is this was it was is was uh indian six mil that was um heavily corrected by a very talented person and and uh, tailored to fit and move and work properly and it does now and um, after you've used it for a while as well the rings kind of sort of self burnish and soap shelf like the more it gets used that the, just the more cloth like it becomes um, but it's just something to be aware of and it, it's actually really important. So to sum up, uh, there's a lot being covered in this massive <laughs> discussion, hasn't there? Um, it's very, very important if you want to get a plate harness to pick your armour wisely for a whole bunch of reasons. You need to pick your armour wisely, but you also need to research what goes underneath the armour and get that sorted out as well. And the one thing that I meant to mention earlier actually was to do with measurements. And um, we've talked about how the the garment, the, the arming doublet that you wear under the armour has to fit well and move well, and the male has to be usually close fitting or certainly well fitted uh, for the design purpose. But then you need to have those things in place to provide the measurements or the body casts or anything else to the armourer to make the plate armour that's going to go over the top of those things. And I know a lot of people, and I might be one of those people, who has taken measurements that didn't have everything on that should have been on, and so the plate has been made correctly by the armourer, but I didn't essentially provide enough info because I didn't have... You provided the wrong... Either. Yeah, I provided the wrong information because I didn't have necessarily my male standard, the collar on, or, you know, I didn't have my voiders on. My current armour, one of the reasons I don't wear voiders with it, is number one, I haven't had access to well enough made voiders, but secondly, the arm harness on my armour, bearing in mind it was bought second hand by someone who's got a similar physical size and shape to me, is slightly too tight on my arms. I've got slightly bigger arms than the person it was made for, and it works okay, but not necessarily with mail shoved in as well. And you need to allow for that extra space for the voiders. Yeah, it's still all these things. You could go mad trying to consider all the <laughs> We have done, I yeah, think. I, I think this video is demonstration yeah. of that. <laughs> and that's the thing. You probably not... There's too much to maybe get everything right. And, and some of it is... It's just going to come through experience. Yeah. And I suppose this video is really just to, to give you a prime and go, actually think about this stuff. Mm. Actually consider your undergarments. Your mail is important. Mm. You're going to have to spend some money on getting it right. Sorry. Mm. Same with the clothes. And with your armour, give it some consideration. Where are they? Who are they? And even to some degree, 
how well did they respond to emails and pick up and communicate? Yeah. What kind of relationship can you have with that person? Because uh, and it's a lot of money and it's a lot of time down the pipe. Yeah, and remember that the minute that you, and this is a point that Zach, Zachary Evans always, um, uh, you should check out his channel by the way, he does a lot of videos on armour, but he, he always makes this point that once the armour's delivered to you, that's not the end of the story. There is a period of adjustment, tweaking, learning more about your armour, about would you, would you call it the end of the beginning? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The or beginning. the beginning of the end. The beginning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, you have to almost accept that, unlike with a sword that you go and buy from Albion or whoever else, and it arrives, there you go, it's a perfect thing, it will remain the same. Armour isn't like that. Armour will require additional tweaking and adjustments. It never ends. Getting to no. know it. Uh, you know, my armour, I've made changes to my armour which weren't necessary at the beginning, perhaps, but through using it, I have um, found that I want this to be slightly different or that to be slightly different. And it might simply be, you know, grinding off a little bit of a corner here or a bending a little bit of a plate there, you know, these tiny little things, you just notice something catches on something else or something digs in a bit when you do a certain thing. I don't think, in, I, I think, I think the general consensus is no armour is ever completely done. No. Not, never completely fully done. There will always be something you can do. It's almost like a living thing yeah. that, that, that sort of almost has to grow around an, you. An organic yeah. process. You live with it. You yeah. change together. But what you should prepare <laughs> yourself for is uh, a fair amount of cost, time, um, learning, um, tears. Uh, some tears. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, some, sometimes re-evaluating what you want out of it as well. Don't be afraid, perhaps, to think that this arm might not be perfect, but further down the line, you might find that you want to change the arm harness or the pauldrons or the gauntlets. You want to change something about it and maybe switch to something else that still works with that armour, but just works better for the purpose that you've intended it for. For example, jousting. I know lots of people who joust who get a certain set of gauntlets and then find that that pair of gauntlets is just a pain in the butt to joust with and so they get different gauntlets further down the line. You'll notice if you look at many photos of jousters, a lot of the time they're not wearing gauntlets because of the problems they have with their gauntlets couching the lance and this kind of stuff. So, so yeah. A massive topic. Once again, thank you to Matt Lewis for joining me for this. We have um, shared uh, some some woes over the years to do with our armour experiences. Maybe at some point further down the line, we'll do a follow up to this video. If you've got specific questions, either for Matt or for me, about what you've seen on this video or some of the things we've said, specific questions, post in the comments below. We'll have a look at those and maybe we can get back together and focus on very specific points and drill down a bit deeper into specific points in future videos. Yeah, but, yeah that's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, and also, I guess, uh, Matt, you'll be around to maybe answer some specific questions on yeah, the comments yeah, sure. as well. If I, I will do that. Uh, in the comments down below. So thanks a lot for watching. Um, this has been a marathon, I think. I hope you've stuck with us. Um, but it's a huge topic, and I think it was quite ambitious to try and... We'll call this a toe dip. <laughs> do, maybe, yeah, Maybe exactly. we can expand... Yeah, some more if the, if in individual devices. directions on specific yeah. things in future videos. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Thanks a lot to Matt for joining me here, and I'll see you guys soon. Cheers, folks. <laughs> thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.